Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning, Good morning. and happy Sabbath. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Today, this Sabbath, we're going to be talking about the lesson, Laying Up Treasure in Heaven. Our memory text is for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? That's a good question. Yeah. But David, before we get started, would you pray for us? Absolutely. Loving Lord Jesus Christ, Father God in heaven and Holy Spirit, we just thank you for this opportunity to discuss what is most important. That is eternal life, treasure, Jesus Christ. So Lord, as we journey through our life, today's Sabbath school lesson is all about that. Help each and every one of us so we can answer the questions that many people will be asking through the Holy Spirit. Bless the audience, keep us safe, forgive our sins, and everybody else on this Sabbath day, keep us holy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So there are many out there who give us investment strategies, but Jesus gave us the best investment strategy, and he begins it with this, Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Hmm. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. So Jesus gave us this strategy to really look more at our treasure in heaven rather than here on earth. And Matthew 6.21 says, where our treasure is, is where our heart is. So in other words, what we spend our money on, what we focus our time on, is really where our heart is. Because wherever we put our money, <clears throat> our heart is sure to follow. So if our heart is interested in investment, in toys, in uh, partying, that's where our heart really is. But if our, if our treasure is with God, then our money and our time will be focused on God. Do you want a heart for the kingdom of God? If so, then put your time and money and possessions where it will reap eternal rewards. Focus all onto God's work. If you do, you will soon become even more interested in the work, and your heart will follow. So how do we do this? So let's, we're going to look at some scriptures. We're going to go through a number of scriptures here. Um, and one of, our, one of our ways is investment. Ellen White says, when we invest in church and God's work by acknowledging these aspects of God's kingdom on earth, we invest in heaven. So what she's saying is if we invest here doing God's work, we're investing in heaven. We need to understand that by investing in heaven, that we are investing on earth as well. Earthly treasures are blessings when rightly used. Those who have them should realize that they are lent them of God and should cheerfully spend their means to advance his cause. Where our treasure lies is an indication of loyalty. I can't say that often enough, and priority. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This, is all, this also is vanity. So the silver, never, we never have enough. Those who want more never have enough. We see that on Wall Street. We see that everywhere. More, 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 more. Luke 16, 10 and 11 says, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in least is also unjust in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, you will commit your trust to your true your trust to the true riches. So it's up to us to evaluate where our riches are. So when we invest our time and money in worldly undertakings, we love mammon more than God. Luke 16, 13 says, no servant can serve two masters. And we talked about this last week. He'll love one and hate the other, or love the other and hate, hate the one or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. So it's really impossible for us to have two, to, to have two masters. But we know that God wants our heart. Proverbs twenty three twenty six. My son, give me your heart 
and let your eyes observe my ways, and we can offer them to him by investing in his work. Therefore, the divine commission, our purpose on this earth is to proclaim salvation to all the nations. In Matthew 28, uh, 19 and 20, God says, go and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you even until the end of the age. We also see even more in Revelation 14, where God talks about us in the final days promoting the three angels' messages. In terms of sin, heaven invested the blood of Jesus in our salvation, Jesus the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, Knowing that you were not redeem, redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as the lamb without blemish and without spot. He gave us the promise of the Holy Spirit would remain with us always as an assurance of redemption. Again, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, in him you also trusted that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you have believed, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possessions to praise of his glory. Many have gone as far as to give their lives for the gospel, and we see that those are truly laying up treasure in heaven. We see the blood of the martyrs is a most precious investment and that it was share, shed for God's word. Revelation 6, 9, and 10 says, when, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls who had been slain for the word of God and for their testimony which they held. That's pretty close to God, right under the altar. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. So Ellen White has this to say in uh, the fourth volume of the Spirit of Prophecy about the Waldensian martyrs. And this is very heart-wrenching to me. With naked feet and in coarse garments, these missionaries pass through great cities and traverse provinces far removed from their native valleys. Everywhere they scattered the precious seed, churches sprang up in their path, and the blood of the martyrs witnessed for the truth. The day of God will reveal a rich harvest of souls gathered by the labors of these faithful men. So as we get into today's lesson, we will be looking more at this aspect of laying up treasures in heaven. So Mark, do you want to talk about Noah who found grace? I think the big question is, are you ready to make a change for God? Yes. And we're going <laughs> to... Thanks, David. That is and we question. know that, <laughs> that, that Noah did this. Yes. And we're going to study about Noah's story, and we're going to learn how through Noah's story, the things that we need to do to help lay up treasures in heaven, ultimately by following God's path. And so let's dig into Noah's story a little bit. Let's, um, let's read Genesis 6, 5 through 14 to refresh ourselves with this and talk about Noah and use his as a great example of how to lay up treasures in heaven. Then Genesis 6, verses 5 through 14. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Mm. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth, and he grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man who I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah as a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was so was corrupt, was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. Through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. 
Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. God told Noah what to do. And so one way to, that we can follow his lay up treasures in heaven is follow the path that he's outlined to us. And he gave Noah a path to do this. But it wasn't an easy path. Um, you know, he was told to go and build this, this ark in his backyard maybe or out in a field out there where there was never, ever any, there was no chance of a flood up until this time. Yes. And he was told about the flood, of course, and he needed to spread the word and spread the others. But I can imagine that people would look at them and go, what is this, what is he doing? Okay. It was hard work. It was not easy work. He had to, lay, he had to build a huge ark by himself maybe with his sons too. In fact, um, and so I would say, why, how do you go about this when you have a path in front of you? How, do you? how do you focus on that? And one of the things I think about from Noah is that he focused on God's will. He knew what God asked him to do. In fact, I was thinking about this. If you have a big project at work and you are really intent on, on doing stuff at work, usually what happens is at the end of the project, you realize, yeah, it was tough, but it went by really quickly. It was focused. And I think that's one way that we can do, focus on doing God's will. The other thing we need to be aware of is that when we are going down God's path, know that there's going to be doubters to your work. And in fact, the more vocal you are, I would say the more doubters are going to come up. In fact, Ellen White talks about the doubters that happened during Noah's time in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 96. She said, The world before the flood reasoned that for centuries the laws of nature had been fixed. The recurring seasons had come in their order. Heretofore here rain had never fallen. The earth had been watered by a mist or dew. The rivers had never yet passed their boundaries, yet had borne their waters safely to the sea. Fixed decrees had kept the waters from overflowing their banks. At the time of Noah, there were many, many doubters. In fact, there were all doubters, except Noah and his family. Today, it's end times. We know that the time of the end is coming. And we are also warned that there will be many doubters about end time events. 2 Peter verses 3, or Peter, 2 Peter 3 verses 3 through 7 says this, Knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And I'm going to stop here. They, they're, they're forgetting about the, the flood. They're forgetting about the things that God promised. And let's read on. He, he, they said in Peter, verses five, Peter 3, verses 5, for this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in water, by which the water that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. When God finished the flood, he promised that he would never do it again. The last thing that's going to happen is the earth will be renewed by fire. Let's talk about the other thing that we can learn from, John, from, his, from Noah's work. And I think this concept of delayed gratification. He, uh, this idea is that he had to work, he did have to work 120 years. I mean, this was time that he had to focus um, on God's message. It wasn't immediate gratification. He could, have been, he could have been building his own house at that time, but instead he was building something for the Lord. The other one I want to point out is that during our time and when we spread God's message on our path, on our journey, he wants us to try our hardest to spread our message. He wants us to use our, power, our, our money, our experience, our skills to, to help in his message and not go after, as Barbara was mentioned, mammon, you know, unworldly goods. Like the parable of the unjust steward that comes out. The master praised his money manager who had cheated him for being dishonest for his money. God instead wants us to work as hard as we can with our money and our gifts to spread his message. Mm -hmm. Luke 16, verses 8 through, 9, uh, 8 through 11 says this, and, and so the master commanded the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. Jesus is saying here, 
He wants us as sons of light to do everything we can in our, ma- in our power to spread his message. And I say to you, make friends of yourself with unrighteous mammon, and when they fail, they may receive you in an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful in what is much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust in what is much. As Barbara mentioned earlier, and I think I wanted to re-say that. The last thing I think we learned from Noah's message and Noah's story is the concept of faith. He was told this. He had to have faith that this was going to happen. The banks had never flooded ever, as Ellen White said, in the rivers before. He had to have faith that this would happen. And Hebrews 11, verse 7 says this, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet moved, moved with godly fear, prepared an an ark for the saving of his household, by, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to our to faith. The last question is, are you ready to make a change for God? Thank you. Very well. Thank you. So we see that Noah was willing to give everything he had for God, even when it didn't make sense. Yeah. So, David, talk to us about Abraham, the father of faith. Well, thank you both for explaining it very well, because for Abraham, it was another leap of faith, things that didn't make sense. In fact, I would say that Abraham was one of the first post-Diluvian missionaries, the greatest missionary of his time, and a disciple of Christ. And that is the very, you know, that is something we don't really think about in, the, in a sense, but that's what it is. And Hebrew 11.6 says, Mark, you mentioned faith. It's all about faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Those who come to God must believe that he is. God has incorruptible sovereignty and sovereign incorruptibility. And so my slide two, you see Genesis 12, 1 to 3. I just want to focus on this verse because this verse is because they're so important. Now the Lord had said to Abram, remember Abram means father of many. Now do you know the time difference between God called him? And then he actually had Isaac, was 25 years. So he was called at age 75. Yeah. And then at 99, his name was changed from Abraham to Abraham. And he had Isaac. So God actually, he had to wait 100 years before he has that promise. You know, he was 100 years old. So this is incredible you know, journey. So it's about journey of faith. So let's go and read. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and your father's house to a land that I will show you. Your country, your family, your father's house. Essentially live what that's comfortable, leave what's that safe and go and preach. Because it says, I will make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing you shall be a blessing not only he will bless me or you or barbara but we will be a blessing to others what i really like at the verse three it says and in you all the families not just one all of them through jesus christ right that is the key so abraham was thinking you know yeah i'm gonna be blessed but do I really want to be a blessing to others, you know? Why do I want other people to be saved? Remember, sometimes we have that type of jealousy, right? But here we see that Abraham is a type of Christ, right? He was willing to go to a place where there's danger. He has no family to support him, nothing, yet he went. So in slide three, you know, Jesus gave the same commandment. Um, he, he, he says that, um, you know, the great multitude um, went out with him, Uh, This is Mark um, 5.25. Now great multitudes went out with him, and he turned to them and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So guess what? By definition, Abraham is a disciple of Jesus. So Mark mentioned, you just have to have that faith. So Jesus was the one that's asking Abraham to leave, and Jesus said the same thing to his disciples, right? Right? This is one of the greatest ways to store treasures. Now, the key here is the journey, right? You know what's amazing about this? We're all in the journey, like Abraham. Because why? We don't know the future. I don't know what's going to happen five minutes from now. So we can have that journey with God, 
Or we can just do it based on what I feel is what my plan is, right? And guess what? Jesus said, don't, you don't want to be blind leading the blind. If we have, don't have God and we're making that journey, we're going to be blind leading the blind and everybody's going to perish. So Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will make your path straight. We know that in the journey, Abraham sometimes made his own decisions here and there. But what's amazing is that he always listened to God when God talked to him. And, and, and so that was the key. Um, remember Adam and Eve, when they sinned, what did they do? They hide from Jesus. Okay, and Jesus says, where are you? So we're hiding. Now, there's a verse in Genesis. It says, this verse um, uh, where it, uh, God says that in, uh, when he became Abraham, uh, Genesis 17, he says, walk before me and be blameless. So what does a kid, we want our kids to walk in front of us, right? So we can see where they go, what they're doing. So they're not nabbed by mountain lions or whatnot, right, if we go on camping. So the key here in a journey is to be transparent with God. That's how you store treasures. It's not about sinning, falling, this and that. It's about being transparent. And that's what God said about Job. He said he was blameless and upright because every day, twice a day, he came to God confessing sins for his children and for himself. So that is the journey for treasure. So when we look at this, we see that um, Jesus asked us to leave everything, and that's the same Jesus asked Abraham, and Abraham did it for us. Now, Abraham's journey, our journey, is first of all, Abraham believed that this is Jesus, he's from God, so I'm going to have to believe it, right? That's justification, right? But then his journey through life is the process of sanctification. So what it is for all of us, and when we go through life and we accept Jesus as our Savior, we go through this journey of sanctification, and that's how we earn treasure. And what's the greatest treasure? Treasure is Jesus Christ. And this sanctification starts with obedience. And you know what faith is? Faith is stepwise obedience. That's what faith is, because God doesn't show us every step right away, but we have to make that step. So, um, that, so let's go through uh, 12 things that I thought was the way Abraham learned, uh, earned, uh, sanct you know, earned uh, eternal life, uh, or the treasures in heaven. Number one, he understood God's will is perfect. Matthew 6, 10, uh, Lord's Prayer, is, Jesus says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He knew that. Number two, Abraham knew that faith, faith is not a product of instant gratification, okay? It is something that happens with journey, right? Number three, Abraham understood that earthly comfort must be secondary. Leave everything and follow me. That's what Jesus told the rich ruler, and he had trouble with it, right? Mark 10, 21. Abraham understood that family can be a problem, so he says, Put God first. So that's what Jesus said, unless you hate. You know, he says, wherever there's problem, it's not hating people. It's actually, is there some way I'm influenced by something that would take me away from being kind and loving to my fellow neighbor? Then we need to just, you know, uh, remove that component from us. So that's what Abraham understood, and he did that. Abraham understood that the faith is a stepwise, lifelong obedience, right? He, we, like I mentioned, we are, we are all going without knowing. The question is, are we going to focus on God while we're going without knowing? If we focus on God, going without knowing, that's true faith. Okay, number six, Abraham was content with God's plan, and that's the key. First Peter 5, 6, 7, it says we got to be content with whatever happens. Abraham understood the true importance of worshiping God. You know what happened? Wherever Abraham went, he erected an altar. Barbara, what is an altar? A place of worship. So he was the first builder of churches, post-Diluvian world, okay? Which is amazing. God, and and that, through him, people knew that there's God, and this is how you worship God. And, who, you know, people obviously asked him who he was. Then we already mentioned number eight, he was a type of Christ. Number nine is that I, we already mentioned this also, that he is one of the first disciples of Jesus, post-Diluvian world. You know, Melchizedek was... The priest of God, he was the disciple. In fact, Abraham, Mrs. Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets that um, Abraham's father, Terah, was actually a priest also because that's the genealogy, but he was a priest and they were mixing the godly worship with the pagan worship. And that's why he needed to get out of there. Number 10, Abraham paid tithe. Isn't this whole Sabbath school quarter is about tithe, right? And people knew him 
as a great prince. How do you become a prince, Barbara, uh, Mark? We become more gracious, kind. We have stuff to give, right? So we, he was kind, and we know that he used to call people Lord. You know, when Jesus came to see him, he was a stranger, everybody around him, he called them Lord, right? So he was very respectful to people. Number 11, Abraham understood that Sarah and uh, him must be in one flesh. So I've never, Abraham, in those day and age, treated Sarah with so much love and respect. That is amazing. We never even thought to think about that, but that is important, okay? And Jesus says we need to be one flesh with our spouse. Abraham was wealthy, but the most important thing was he was a great steward of his wealth, right? So in, when people asked him, oh, you can have this uh, property for burial, Abraham said, no, 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 no. I'm going to pay you, what, 400 pieces of silver? Very expensive. And he was able to buy that. And number 12 is it took God nine, you know, uh, 99 years later, he got Isaac, and he didn't even see his grandson, but yet he stayed faithful. See, that's the way to, that's the way to store treasure and love one another. Thank you, Barbara. Very nice. Thank you. Now we're going to look at Lot. You know, I, I can relate to Lot a little bit because sometimes you have to learn things the hard way. And so I can appreciate what Lot, Lot went through. <laughs> And as David said, Abraham left his homeland. And we see in Genesis 13, too, that Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. So we see that God really blessed Abraham to the point that he was rich. And God and he had a great relationship. But Lot went with him. And Lot, too, was blessed with um, flocks and herds and tents. So both of these men were wealthy. And we find that as their, their families grew and their herds grew, there started to be some strife over land and over, over who, what belonged to who. And so uh, Lot and Abraham had a conversation. We read in Genesis 13, 10 through 12, and Lot lifted his eyes and saw the plain of the Jordan. So they decided to separate their ways. And Lot looked at the, the lush land, what looked like the best land. It was well watered before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go towards Zor. Then Lot chose himself uh, the plain of Jordan, <clears throat> and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent as far as Sodom. So what we see is that Lot chose what he thought would be the best to grow his, his land. It was best for him. So wasn't that a little bit of me first? A lot of me first. <laughs> but Abraham was happy with whatever God had, had left for him. Because he knew in his relationship with God that God would take care of him and never leave him or forsake him. So Lot felt justified with his decision as he um, headed for the cities. And Abraham um, let him go. So we find out then what happens as he gets closer to Sodom. And we see that in Genesis 14. And as things seem to go well at times, there are times that things change and they don't go so well. And what happened was the kings of Sodom got into it with some other kings. And we see we're going to start in Genesis 14.10. And the valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and some there fell there, and some remained and fled into the mountains. Then they took the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. So here was this big battle, and off they went. But the problem for uh, Lot was they also took Lot and went off <clears throat> with him as well and all his goods. Then one who had escaped came and told Abraham the Hebrew, for he dealt uh, in Mamre. When, now when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, 
He armed his 318 trained servants. That's a lot of servants who were born in the house and they went in pursuit as far as Dan. So if he went from Canaan to Dan, that's a pretty good sized hike. He divided his forces against them by night and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them to Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods, also brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the women and, and people. So the king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But look at what Abraham does. He said to the king, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from the, the thread of the sandal trap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you say I have made Abraham rich except only that the young man, what the young men have eaten and a portion of the men who went with me. Uh, let them take their portion. So Abraham was, was completely doing this out of his love for Lot and his desire to bring back Lot and return what the king needed. So sometimes... Our quest for more stuff gets us into problems, and we don't learn our lesson. But what did Lot do? Did, had Lot learned his lesson, and he was taken captive? No. Where'd he go? He went right back to Sodom. But in God's great mercy, he sent messengers of warning to Lot and his family, letting them know of the pending destruction of the cities. We see in Genesis 18:20. Through 33, I will go down now, and whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that come to me, if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went to Sodom, but Abraham stood before the Lord, and Abraham came near and said, so where we're at here in this story with Abraham is that God has told Abraham he's going to destroy Sodom. And Lot is there. And so it's really interesting how, how Abraham bargains with God. So don't be afraid to bargain with God a little bit, especially if it's for the good of others. Maybe not if you're going to try to win the lottery, but um, for that which is righteous. So he says in verse 24, well, if there's 50 righteous in the city, will you not destroy it? And, and God goes, uh, sorry, there's not 50. And he says, well, how about five less? If there's 45, um, I will not destroy it. And God's going, no. And so they go 40, 30, 20. And finally, God, uh, Abraham says, if there are 10 should be found there, I will not destroy for the sake of 10. But there weren't even 10 righteous men in Sodom. So, uh, God, we know what happens with Sodom and Gomorrah. The angels come to, to Lot, and he doesn't want to leave. He's, he's in no rush to leave the city. And it ends up, when he finally does leave, it's just he, his wife, and two daughters. And even his wife, God told them, don't look back. Don't look back. She loved that city so much and had such a hard time letting go that she had to look back and what happened she was turned into a pillar of stone and we know that lot what happened with lot and his daughters and so we see that lot even though he started out making great decisions the lure of the city the lure of sodom drew him back to where he did where he shouldn't be and with that because of that he probably lost his, most of his family. There were three that survived. Amazing. What would be the end times like? Yeah. yeah. So when we, when we, sometimes, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of discussion about country living. And maybe sometimes it's better to get away from the lure of the city. But... Let's try to learn our lessons the way Abraham learned his lessons and not the way Lot.
learned his lessons. Yep. Amen. Okay, well, we're going to jump to Wednesday, right? Yeah. Okay. And, and you're going to talk about the deceiver, ooh, from deceiver to prince. Wow. Yep. We're going to talk about Jacob, and we're going to talk about Jacob's story and how we can learn from his story and how to build treasures in heaven. Yeah. And the idea that I want us to think about is that God wants us to grasp on as hard as we can to his promises. So we know the story of Jacob. In fact, Jacob was a God-fearing man, but he did sin. In fact, how did he, his big sin when he was early a young, young man was that he, he tricked his dad, his father, Isaac, into blessing him instead of his brother, Esau, and with, with influences from his, his mom, Rebekah. And so we start this journey because of this sin. Rebecca says, and we're going to go to Genesis 27, verses 43 to 45. She says to her son, Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to your brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him for a while while your brother's fury subsides. When your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, I'll send word to you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? You remember, Esau was so mad, he said, I'm going to kill you. So, so Jacob, Jacob has to go. And on his path, and he has to go, and he goes to uh, his mom's brother, Laban, and he stops along the way. And he stops because he needs the rest. I mean, the sun has gone down. And we're going to read what he, happens to him at this place, um, went out from near Beersheba. Let's read Genesis 28, verses 10 through 15. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night before, because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones that, of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Well, I don't know if I could, I could sleep on a rock, but he did one. And then he dreamed, and he, behold, the ladder was set up on earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood up above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land in which you lie, I will give you to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east and to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. It was pretty interesting. He gets the same promise that Abraham got about, about spreading his seed because he's a descendant of Abraham and his descendants will also spread out. But I want to reread verse 15 again. And he said this, God said to him, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I've spoken to you. And I was reading this and I was reading this story and I was, and I was looking at it and I go, you know, isn't this our story? Aren't we all sinners? Haven't we all sinned and had to make a change? Jacob is making a change. And amazingly, isn't, God, isn't that God's promise to us that he will always be with us wherever we go? He's going to be with us until he comes again, until this land that we have gets the new earth. He's going to be with us. So think about that. I think that when I was reading this, this is kind of our story. So let's read what Jacob does. He has to go away for 20 years, and, and he, uh, it wasn't just a short term as a t time as his mom was hoping. It was a long time, 20 years. In fact, he never saw his mother again. And, um, you know, during this 20 years, you guys know a little bit of the story. I'll just, you know, he, he wants to marry Rachel, and eventually he married Leah, and then eventually married Rachel, and then he had a family with them. And God says, go back to the land where Esau is. It's time for you to go back. And so he takes his, his wealth that he had, he had acquired in this land in Haran, and he went started going back. And during that time, on that journey, before he meets Esau, now he's scared of Esau because Esau said last time he talked with him, he said he was going to kill him. So he's pretty scared. He's pretty worried. But this is what he says. This is what Jacob does. And I want us to think about this and how it helps us. Genesis 32, verses 22 to 31. 
That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. And when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he, he wrestled with, this, with the man. And then the man said, let me go for his daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Then the, Jacob, then the man asked him, what is your name, Jacob? He answered. And the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. And Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask me my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. In Hosea 12, verses 4, it says, Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor with him. And I was reading about this, and I was thinking, you know, this is, it, J- Jacob says it's a God. You know, Hosea says it's an angel. It's some heavenly being that he's, he's attacking and that, that, that he's wrestling with. Do you think that heavenly being could have left at any time? I think it could have done. Why didn't he? Why didn't? Why was, why was he able to hold on to him? Ellen White brings it out in Patriarchs and Prophets very well. Through humiliation, repentance, and self-surrender, this sinful, erring mortal prevailed with the majesty of heaven. He had fastest, fastened his trembling grasp upon the promises of God, and the, infinite, the heart of infinite love could not turn away the sinner's plea. God wants us to grasp onto his promises with everything we can. I was reading another little translation. It's called Young's Little Translation, another translation. It's kind of pretty literal, and it's interesting. You know how it says up here in, in New King James Bible, it says, it says, let me go for his daybreak. Down here in Young's Little, little Translation, it says, the angel says, send me away for the dawn hath ascended. It's like God, the angel is saying, just do you, do you try go now. And instead, Jacob says, no, I will not send you away until you have blessed me. He's demanding a blessing. Let's read Luke 15, verses 9 through 13. God says that Jesus says this again. So I will say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. To him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you, then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He, God gave to Jacob a blessing. He can give each one of us a blessing. Um, and, you know, and I think that, and, and that's our journey. You know, that's our path. We're all kind of sinners. But the way up uh, goods in heaven is to go down God's path and ask and grasp on to the promises that he's given us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, David. Yes. You are going to talk about Moses. Yeah. Moses in Egypt. That's the Thursday's lesson. Mark, as I was listening to you talking about that, it just gave me goosebumps. <laughs> because with, with that faith that Jacob had, you know, that's the miracle, right? Yeah. Jesus could do miracle when people have faith. Amen. And that was amazing. So we have to have faith, like Mark says, to ask for that treasure, you know, in heaven. So that's the same thing with Moses, actually. Because all these stories, there's a similarity. It's all about faith. You know, <laughs> ultimately, it's all about faith. So Amen. what's the question to you guys and to all of us is that what is the one thing that Moses did that is unique about his life story, you know, and his, in his, how he stored the treasure heavenly treasure. And the answer would be that he was concerned about his people who are the slaves rather than his own status. And his own status was amazing. He was the prince of Egypt, the most powerful country, I would say, in the history of the world. You know, if you look at all the structures that Egypt has, you know, America is the most powerful country. But in terms of the wealth and everything, that was the most, and he was one of the prince, but he did not care about it. Time. 
you know, yep. its existence. And he was at the head. He was a prince, right? He, he was at the prince. And he essentially rejected, Mrs. Lynn White says he rejected his position to be with his own people. He rejected the world for pain and suffering so that he can have that treasure, the eternal life through Lord Jesus Christ. So again, I, you know, not me, but I, there are some spirit, in, the Holy Spirit inside me was helping me with some points that you guys might think about. And also you can use that in your life to look at Moses' life and how his life can help us store treasures in heaven, what he did. So point number one, God kept Moses alive. Remember, there was a decree went out, all the male childs will be, um, um, you know, they, they will be dead. So in Romans 13, 1, it says the authorities that exist have been established by God. So the plan of everything is through God, and God has a bigger plan. Here, Moses survived because of God. He is the one who came up with the plan, right? God raises up managers, but Jesus is the only Savior. So laying up treasures in heaven is understanding our, our role as a manager for God's will. Point number two is 1 Corinthians 121. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. So God can work through anyone, including pagans. And we see here God is using slaves, you know, Israelites, to uh, accomplish his work. And he's using Pharaoh's daughter, who is a pagan to have Moses being rescued. So laying up treasures in heaven is to understand that with God, all things are possible. Jesus said, Mark 10, 27. Point number three is that we need to keep our perspective. We need to keep perspective of our lives, right? Um, basically, um, you know, here uh, we see that Moses' parents, they knew what the goal is, that they are in Egypt, but they are not part of the royal family, right? They could have asked Moses, oh, do this for me, you know, put me in a different house, you know, all these favors, right? But they did not ask for that, okay? They didn't look like they were interested in the status of Moses because Moses' mom and his, sis and his sister actually raised him, right? So uh, this is something that they always kept that focus, like Mark mentioned earlier. The focus is God, not Wealth, not, you know, Egyptian power, right? Point number four. You know, uh, Moses' um, mother, Jochebed, had only 12 years to teach her child to pray, to trust, and to honor God and shape his character. Jesus' mom, Mary, also did that. And you know, at age 12, Jesus was at the temple talking to people that, that are, like, amazed by his knowledge. So, in, 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 you know, in Jewish culture, something called bar or bar mitzvah, which is coming of age that happens at age 12. So generally, kids are taught most of the stuff by age 12 about God. So point number four is children must be treated as heavenly treasures from a young age because we really don't have a lot of time with our children nowadays with the internet and all the distractions and most of their characteristics develop by age 12 anyway. So we, we really don't have a lot of time. So we need to start now when we have little children. Point number five, storing treasure in heaven is being in the world, but not of the world. See, Moses was instructed, Acts 7, 22, he says, instructed in all wisdom of the Egyptians. He was mighty in words and deeds. But guess what? He didn't care for it. He did not care for it because he cared about the treasure in heaven. Moses was, uh, like again, he was at the very best country, yet he was always identified with his people. Very, very humble. Point number six, laying up treasures is in heaven is to not oppress people. You know how this all got started? New king arose in Egypt and he started oppressing the Israelites. And they started crying. And then God said, hey, these people are being oppressed. I'm going to have to do something. So in our personal life, don't be an oppressor at work. Don't people put down. Don't be condescending. Don't feel like, you know, then who knows? God might go against us and then we're going to be in trouble. We're going to lose treasures in heaven. So let's remember that. Point number seven, being humble allows us to store treasure in heaven. See, Moses, Moses was confident in God, okay? He, he believed him. You know what's interesting? I, I used to think like when God came to Moses, remember Barbara, Mark, he was always hesitating. He's like, I'm not ready, da, da, this and that. And I can understand he was in this median with the new language he learned and for 40 years he didn't have 
the Egyptian language anymore. So, you know, we think that he's stuttering, but he really didn't have the, you know, grasp of it. But one interesting thing about that is Moses was hesitating because that's his humility. He could have told God, okay, this is my plan. I'm going to go there, do this and that and that. But here he hesitated and let God take over. Sometimes it's good to just wait and listen rather than come up with this confident plan because we won't know that God is in control. Well, I think the time he spent in those, the wilderness helped him with his humility. Absolutely. Too. absolutely, And that was necessary. That was a necessary thing. Point number, thank you, Barbara. Point number eight, taking a stand against evil. See, Moses saw somebody getting beat up, his own people. He took a stand. He took it a very drastic stand. But nonetheless, he always identified with them. But you know, one interesting thing about that is that Moses probably was thinking that he wanted to be the anointed savior by his own people. But guess what? Guess what? His own people turned against him, right? So uh, we see that story that Moses, uh, when he saw that nobody's looking, he killed that Egyptian, but next day, everybody knew about it. So what, what happens here? We really need to realize that always trust in God. Don't take actions. Don't take matters in your own hand. Because unless God anoints me, if, if I feel seek anointment and acceptance from other people, it's not going to work. See, Moses was going the wrong direction, and then he suffered, and he went to, the, you know, went to be trained in the desert, right? Point number two. A 10, we already talked about it, by faith, right? We, Moses did everything by faith, and that was amazing. You know, he was rejoicing in faith. Why? Because he was the most humble person in numbers. Um, it says that he was the most humble person on the earth. How can you be humble serving God? When you rejoice in God. I cannot be humble serving God if I'm like always complaining. Okay, it's not going to work. So to be humble, you have to be happy in God. And point number 12 you remember how Moses could not enter into the kingdom, into the uh, promised land? Because at that one point, one moment in time, instead of elevating God, he said, you rebels, must I do this? And then he hits the rock twice. And God says, you didn't respect me. You know the thief on the cross? He respected Jesus while the other one was, was putting Jesus down. So our goal in life to store treasures in heaven is to always remember, give God the glory. So pretty much, you know, it's the same thing. Basically, we need to remember Jesus is the focus. It's easy for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than a rich man through the gates of heaven. Why? Barbara mentioned that when we're too distracted, guess what? We can't just see that little gate, but the camel from top can see that laser focus, like you said, through the eye of the needle. Focus, faith in God is the key. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, any final thoughts? Yeah, a couple of thoughts. Uh, so I, I dug into a couple stories. One was Noah, one was Jacob. You know, in both, in both of this, uh, a change was done for God. In the case of Noah, he, God told him to build an ark. In the case of Jacob, he, you know, he needed to repent and become humil humble um, because of his sin. You know, when this is God's path, you know, whether we are a sinner and we're changing our direction or God gives us a special thing to do, whenever we follow God's path with faith, as David said, um, we're going to be laying up treasures in heaven. How beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So we've listened to quite a few of God's greats today. We've talked about quite a few of them. Yep. And... As I was thinking about it, God gave them each choices, just as we have choices every day. And they were willing to follow the lamb. They were willing to follow him where he went. So my challenge for you today is let's follow the lamb wherever he leads us. Yep. And for, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you for today's lesson, Lord. Father, we want our treasure with you in heaven and not on this earth because everything on this earth will no longer be one day and even our lives will no longer be if we're not with you so father we just pray that you would be with each one of us that you would guide our li lives that you would guide our footsteps and lead us in the way everlasting in jesus name amen amen, amen. happy sabbath happy sabbath thank you